Honored guests, the inaugural party and Laurie S. White, 21st president of DePaul University. Thank you. Please be seated. President White, First Gentleman Tillman and family, Board of Trustee members, visiting university and college delegates, academic association representatives, our esteemed faculty, emeriti, staff, alumni, parents, students, Greencastle citizens, and honored guests. I'm Kathy Patterson Vrabeck, class of 1985. As chair of the Board of Trustees, it is my distinct honor to welcome you to the inauguration of Lori S. White as president of DePauw University. This is indeed a great moment for the university as for only the 21st time in our 185 year history, we observe the installation of a new president. The DePaul University thanks you for joining us on this very special occasion and for sharing with us our hopes, our pride and our joy. As you are able, Please join me by now standing as Bishop Julius C. Trimble of the Indiana Conference of the United Methodist Church leads the invocation. Would gentlemen please remove their caps until the invocation is concluded. Following the invocation, please be seated before Dr. Thomas Parham, President of California State University, Dominguez Hills, performs the traditional African libation ceremony. Let us pray. God of grace and God of glory, bless this occasion as a unique gift for this present season in the life of DePaul University. Bestow upon President Lori S. White all that is needed for this journey of leadership, 
she has begun with great enthusiasm, wisdom, and grace. May her passion for excellence, hard work, and adaptive servant leadership be balanced by attention to her own soul care and Sabbath rest. As she champions the cause of student education, may she be surrounded by colleagues and team members who can lean in together in this time of liminality. As we gather to celebrate this occasion, we recognize we are only representative of a greater cloud of witnesses cheering on Dr. White and DePaul Uni University. Some are cheering from near and some afar, as well as family and friends cheering from the corridors of heaven. Great God of life and love, you are called by many names, including Waymaker. We thank you for making a way for Dr. White and her husband, Anthony Tillman, both career educators with a deep passion and commitment to student access, equity, and success to come to Greencastle, Indiana, and DePaul University for such a time as this. We ask your blessings upon all gathered here, representatives from academic institutions, DePaul student body, trustees, faculty, and staff. May we be blessed not to point to our privilege, but to seize this moment to be a blessing to others. Awaken in us a desire to see the best in others and pursue the best for all, the DePaul family, and more, even generations yet unborn. Amen. Good afternoon. Oh, wait a minute. I thought DePaul University was in the house. Good afternoon. Some way I read that existence has a face on every side, and every face teaches a lesson. Those of us that truly understand existence never separate the faces from the lessons they teach. Ladies and gentlemen, if you'd open your program to this beautiful picture. Of this illustrious Dr. Lori S. White. Existence has a face on every side and every face teaches a lesson. Those of us that truly understand existence will not separate the faces from the lessons that she will teach, say the knowledge holders. It is my honor to perform at her request the African Libation Ceremony. Now for those unfamiliar with the tradition, a libation is less of a prayer and more of an invitation. Whatever is, is in the first place spirit. There is a spiritual essence that permeates everything that exists in the universe. And so we invite the spiritual presence of folk into this ceremony to recall not simply the creator and the ancestors and the elders. Why? Because Dr. White understands, much like the great Algerian psychiatrist Franz Fanon argued, that each generation out of relative obscurity must reach out and seek to fulfill its legacy or betray it. She has opted to fulfill it. And so we invite the spirit. We pour libations using water. Why? Because everything that has life in the universe comes up out of water. And we invite the spiritual presence of those who are necessary. We pour water into things that grow. So we have a plant here available. We first of all want to acknowledge four domains. And after each domain, I'll invite the audience to join me when we pour the libation and say, Ashe. Now this is a participatory response. Sister White wants to remind you that this is a call response format. Y'all feeling me? OK. So I know we, in all our academic regalia, but we're about to get cultural up in here. Y'all ready for this? 
So we pour a drop out for the creator, whatever you call the God of the heavens, by whatever name he or she is known. Because God is the source of all truth and all goodness, all mercy and grace. And the proper response is, Ashe. We pour a drop out for the ancestors whose names we do not remember, but whose sacrifice we shall never forget. And all the people said, Ashe. And next, we want to remember the elders, many of whose names we remember. We pour a drop out for the Pharaoh Ramses. We pour a drop out for Queen Hepshetzer. I'm channeling Queen Hepshetzer today, who ruled ancient Kemet with the style that said, not a leaf will fall from a tree until I give it permission. That sound like Lori White to me. <laughs> and all the people said, we pour a drop out. We pour a drop out for Brother Malcolm and for Brother Martin, for Sister Betty and Sister Coretta. We pour a drop out for Sister Rosa Parks and the great educator Mary McLeod Bethune and Dorothy Hyde. We pour a drop out for Noble Drew Ali and for Marcus Garvin. We pour a drop out for all of those folk. And this special drop here is for my teacher and Dr. White's father, Dr. Joseph L. White the contemporary father of the black psychology movement who is smiling down on us from the heavens, we invite his spirit into this space to say, Papa Joe, who would say something like, I'm happy as a big dog today. <laughs> and all the people say it. And now it is your turn to invite the spiritual presence of those who you want to invite into this space to be able to give honor to Dr. White. Call out their names if you would. Ashe, 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 Holler them out, Ashe, 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 Ashe. Ashe. Ashe, 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 Ashe. And as they remember all of those, our parents and loved ones who have gone before us, we invite their presence into this space and we reserve a final drop for the children in understanding that what we do in this day and time we make a better way for them and a better tomorrow and future that they will inherit. And all the people say it. Ashe. And one more time. Ashe. And one final again. Ashe. It is done. Thank you both for being with us today. Several members of our community would now like to welcome you to Greencastle and to our beautiful, warm campus to celebrate this momentous occasion. Please join me in welcoming William A. Dory, Jr., Mayor of the City of Greencastle, on behalf of the citizens of Greencastle. In addition to giving greetings, he will also read a land acknowledgment to recognize the indigenous past, present, and future of DePauw and Greencastle, and to assist us all to understand our own place within that relationship. Along with Bridget Gurley, professor of chemistry and biochemistry and dean of the faculty, Leanne Goines, professor of women's gender and sexuality studies, on behalf of the faculty of DePaul University. Sarah Ryan, Women's Center Director and Staff Member of the Year, on behalf of the staff of DePaul University. D'Angelo McCade, 
DePaw Student Government, I'm sorry, McDade, DePaw Student Government President and Class of 2022 on behalf of the students of DePaul University. And Joseph H. Ross, President of the DePaul Alumni Board and Class of 1984 on behalf of the thousands of loyal DePaul University alumni around the world. As the mayor of Greencastle, I welcome our honored guest, trustees, alumni, faculty, staff, students, and community members to the city of Greencastle and today's inauguration of DePauw's 21st president. I have had the pleasure to work with four DePauw presidents in my time here in Greencastle. With the support of generous alumni and friends and their leadership, each has left a history of partnerships and transformations on the campus and in the community. The campus, its students, its faculty, and its staff are an integral part of our Greencastle community. Today, Dr. White, with new partnerships in mind, I would like to present a proclamation in your honor in recognition of your inauguration. Procl proclamation reads, whereas about 10,000 BC, Indiana was once the home of Paleo Indians. Later, the people of the Woodland culture in 1000 BC were followed by the Mississippian culture of 900 AD. <clears throat> Prior to settlement, the Miami, Shawnee, Potawatomi, Delaware, Kickapoo, and other indigenous peoples inhabited the area. We acknowledge that our community is located on traditional, ancestral, and contemporary lands of these and, and unknown indigenous peoples. The Miami Nation maintains a presence in neighboring Park County. And whereas Western Indiana was first settled by the French in the areas of Vincennes and Terre Haute, and in 1816, Indiana became the 19th state being carved out of the Northwest Territory. In 1822, Putnam County was, was created by the state legislature. <clears throat> Greencastle was platted in 1823. The original plat of the town extended to Seminary Street just behind us, the northern edge of today's campus. And by 1830, the population of Greencastle totaled 1,000 souls with an additional 7,200 in the county. And whereas 185 years ago, in October of 1836, the Indiana Conference of the Methodist Church took final action on a proposal and decided to establish an institution of the first order. Upon an extensive plan of operation and equal to any college or university in the Valley of the Mississippi. With the church establishing a committee to evaluate the offers of the various towns competing for the location of the institution, considering such matters as the amount of money provided by each community as well as the general state of each town. And whereas in 1836, our community of Greencastle raised $25,000, representing 10 to 20 percent of the gross income of the community to induce the committee to select it over Madison, Lafayette, Indianapolis, and several other communities as a site for the new college. Community residents went to great lengths to, to lure the college here. Today, that number would equate to more than $25 million. The local effort might be considered the longest lasting and most transformative economic development project of any community of our size. Whereas in 1837, Indiana Asbury University was founded, since that day, the University, Greencastle, and Putnam County have grown and prospered together. Dr. Alexander Stevenson, a Greencastle physician and farmer, was named the first president of the Board of Trustees. 15 of the first 16 board members were young Methodist farmers, merchants, and professional men of Greencastle. And whereas in 1870, Washington C. DePaul and his family made a generous gift to the university, resulting in a name change to DePaul University as we know today. And whereas the university has continued to thrive 
with the support of alumni, friends, and the community, the campus has grown in size, diversity, and international representation. And whereas, based on her outstanding leadership and academic credentials, on March 4, 2020, the Board of Trustees appointed Dr. White to serve as the 21st president of the university. Now, therefore, the residents of the city of Greencastle and Putnam County officially welcome Dr. White and her husband, Anthony Tillman, on this day of her inauguration as new members of our community. And also, therefore, the residents of Greencastle and Putnam County wish Dr. White the best of success as she leads the university forward as an institution of the first order to rise to new heights of success. Therefore, I proclaim October 1st, 2021, as Dr. Lori S. White Day here in the city of Greencastle. Thank you, Mayor Dory. That was wonderful. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Bridget Gurley, and I'm a long-standing professor in the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry. I also currently serve as Dean of the Faculty. Distinguished guests, members of the Board of Trustees, faculty, staff, students, families, and friends, on behalf of my colleagues, I'm honored to officially and warmly welcome you to this celebration and formal installation of Dr. Lori S. White as our president. As a faculty, we are thrilled, and perhaps even a little scared, to be back on campus, engaging with our students and sharing this day with you. In classrooms, laboratories, and studios, from Asbury Hall to the Lilly Athletic Center, buildings in between, and those that extend beyond those two bookends. Many have remarked about the joy they find in the energy that has returned to campus this year. Colleagues are reconnecting with their disciplinary and interdisciplinary work as our institutional rhythms are being reestablished. We are teacher scholars dedicated to subjects within the arts, humanities, social sciences, natural and physical sciences, and interdisciplinary fields of study that touch multiple areas of the curriculum. I'm continually in awe of the breadth and depth of the scholarly and artistic accomplishments of our faculty. We have colleagues whose foci is at the nanoscale and others whose questions encompass the entire universe. Colleagues who have spent their life's work focused within the United States and others looking at society the world over. Colleagues who create incredible music and art. We will get a taste of those creative talents when later we hear one of our poet colleagues, Professor Eugene Gloria, as he reads a poem he wrote for this event. While I wish I could share at least one sentence about each of my colleagues capturing their contributions, unfortunately there isn't time today. However, I would be remiss if I didn't at least mention Dr. White adds her accomplishments as a scholar of higher education to the many contributions made by our faculty. Dr. White, you have already demonstrated your commitment to DePauw and the well-being of our students during what I'm going to call your pre-year last year. With the pandemic, what a year it was to get started. As faculty members, we are excited to share with you in your do-over year, as I have heard you say. You speak articulately about the value of the liberal arts, sharing how we educate students to be critical thinkers, to, be, to effectively analyze problems, to be great communicators, to be individuals who think creatively and innovatively to res as the way they respond to issues, problems, and challenges, and educate to live and work in diverse communities. Our shared commitment to the liberal arts provides a strong common ground between us. The energy and expertise you bring working with other liberal arts college presidents to form the Liberal Arts College Racial Equity Alliance, or LACRELA, to collaborate on anti-racism work, campus climate research, and programming on how to better serve students of color and address systemic racism, along with your appointments to the Academic Leaders Task Force on Campus Free Expression, 
created by the Bipartisan Policy Center, highlight your national leadership on issues important to our faculty. We are ready to partner with you on both scholarly and practical work surrounding these issues. As I'm sure others will share today, and our audience has read in the program, Dr. White has strong California roots. For me personally, I am pleased we at DePauw are expanding our West Coast connections. Welcome from one California girl to another. A piece I read about in the University Athletics Association Race and Racism series that featured Dr. White allowed me to find yet another common experience that we share. Dr. White is quoted as sharing about her youth, including Campfire Girl meetings. I will add for this audience that Campfire Girls, now referred to as Campfire Fans, have a watchword, Wohilo, used as a greeting, a sign-off, a reminder, and a pledge. Co-founder Charlotte Gulick invented the word in 1910 to celebrate three of the organization's core values, work, health, and love. Wohilo. Campfire fans are committed to working hard, supporting each other's holistic health, and loving each other in the wider world. I think there is ample evidence to us that Dr. White embodies those ideals today. Turning back more directly to my role here, providing a welcome both to those of you who are here and are celebrating with us, and a welcome from our faculty to our president, Dr. White, we are eager to continue with you the important work you've already begun, including on the strategic plan and a freedom of expression policy. We are pleased you too value the library renovation and made the work necessary to move the project forward a priority. We know there is much important work yet to be done on these projects and so many others. We appreciate that you recognize that a faculty by nature critically analyzes everything. That you welcome feedback and acknowledge we create better ideas and plans because of those sometimes tough conversations. As we together undertake the work before us, let us all remember one of the many wonderful Maya Angelou quotes. You can't use up creativity. The more you use, the more you have. I'm confident we will keep our motto found on the university seal. The college is the splendor and light of the common good, forefront in our minds as we work together to continue building the, legacy, the DePauw legacy. On behalf of DePauw, the Board of Trustees, our faculty, our staff, our students, we look forward to our next steps together and achieving great things with you. And now let me invite our colleague, Professor Leanne Goines, Assistant Professor of Women's, Gender, and Sexuality Studies, to the podium. Thank you. <laughs> I'm so excited to be here today, so I'm also um, filled with a lot of gratitude and joy. Um, good afternoon, everyone. <laughs> My name is Leanne Goins. I'm a faculty member in the Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies program and a member of the Black Caucus. Um, I'm so honored to be with you all today and to present welcome remarks on behalf of the black faculty and staff of DePauw as we celebrate the inauguration of DePauw's 21st president, Dr. Lori S. White. Unlike inaugurations before, this inauguration is different. I'm certain someone said this before, and in that moment, it was likely true. But this moment is different. This moment is black excellence. It is the culmination of tireless courage, sacrifice, hope, a lineage of firsts, and a dedication to opening doors. Dr. White, who continues the legacy of her father, Dr. Joseph L. White, a highly honored educator, philanthropist, and pioneer in black psychology is a trailblazer. She's also our ancestors' wildest dreams and our ancestors' gifts to us. It seems a simple statement, <laughs> it seems a simple statement to say that black lives matter. 
that people who look like me deserve humanity to be seen, to be valued, to be treated with dignity and respect. It, however, is not so simple. It carries with it the potential to divide. In a moment of renewal that brings with it the hope, that brings with it hope, what a president says and does not say in their address matters. Dr. White, as she introduced herself and shared her vision in the pre-year before this year, <laughs> unequivocally stated that black lives matter, that my life, a black woman's life mattered. As we grapple with the changing dynamics of our country and we attempt to right the wrongs of our history, we look for those who can lead us not into our deepest fears and anxieties or to stoke hatred and fear. We look for those who within them hope and light radiates. Dr. White, it is truly an honor to welcome you to DePaul personally and on behalf of the Black Caucus. Thank you for renewing hope within us, for radiating light and compassion, and for showing our campus how to move through anything, a pandemic, two virtual semesters, and even revolts over our senior robe colors. <laughs> I'll close with this. My youngest daughter, after interrupting me and my attempts to write this for the fifth time, maybe sixth time, said, wait, Mommy, she looks like me. That means I can be president too? There are no words that can fully express the hopeful joy in her voice or the fullness in my heart. We stand on the shoulders of those who came before us. Thank you for standing for us for my littles, our community, and so, so many others around the world. On behalf of the black faculty and staff, welcome officially to DePauw. Thank you. Greetings on this historic occasion. We'll just keep lowering the microphone <laughs> until it's at exactly the right height. We are gathered here today for the inauguration of the 21st president of DePauw University, Dr. Lori S. White, the first woman and the first person of color to be appointed to this position. I cannot help but think to other significant firsts for our institution in this moment. While reflecting on this with my dear friend, Dr. Tamara Bobuf, former Dean of Faculty and Professor of Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies here at DePauw, I pondered, what would Catherine Alvord say? Catherine Alvord was DePauw's first Dean of Women. She served in this role for over two decades, from 1915 to 1936, when women weren't regularly at the forefront of educational institutions. The Dean of Women position was made popular in the 20th century as more women were being admitted to colleges and universities across the country. Dean Alvord was an important leader on our campus and nationally. She served at a pivotal point in our institution's history and the history of student affairs in American higher education. The same can be said about this very moment we are celebrating here today. In an address to prospective students in 1927, Dean Alvord posed the following questions. Will you be a tourist? or a fellow traveler? Will we journey together or take convenient shortcuts? These are questions for all of us, not just for those prospective students or for our new esteemed president. The vision and direction of DePauw belong to all of us. It is our collective responsibility. Just as Dean Alvord said, we journey together. 
We explore together, we learn together, we discover together, we rise together. This is a moment that all of us should celebrate and remember in the great moments in the history of our institution. On behalf of staff at DePauw and with all of my heart, I congratulate you, President White. I am thrilled and filled with hope and joy to be a fellow traveler on this journey with you. Thank you. Good day, everyone. Let's try that again. Good day, everyone. Good day. That sounds like DePaul to me. My name is D'Angelo McDade, and I currently serve as DePaul's student body president. To right. Today, I bring you greetings on behalf of DePaul student government, the president's round table, and most importantly, the student body of DePaul University. As we gather to celebrate the installation of Dr. Lori S. White as the 21st president of DePaul University, I want you to imagine what it means to rise. And Dr. Lori S. White's a being and rising, we will rise with her. In the short year you, Dr. Lori White, have already been here. You have guided our university through perhaps one of our most challenging years we have ever seen at our institution. A war against the pandemic as it begins to rage forward and on. You have strongly advocated for your students and actively engaged in each and every one of our lives. You have shown us that you are truly committed to creating a DePaul community where staff, students, and faculty alike belong. And for this, we thank you. We thank you for your ability to believe in transformational leaders, for your ability to revitalize a campus, a campus where hopes and morale yearn to be reinvigorated. And as I close, I want you to know that we eagerly wait to forge on beside you as you continuously lead fearlessly us forward. In the words of Maya Angelou, we may encounter many defeats, but not be defeated. And with you as our leader, as our guide, we, the DePaul students and DePaul community, must and will respond to forge forward. And in proper time, we will reap a harvest only if we as a community do not give in or up. So Dr. White, as you are the president of DePaul University, I ask that you not only be the president of DePaul University, but the president for our students and our student body. Thank you. Welcome, Dr. Lori S. White, to the Paul family. I am Joe Ross, the current president of the Paul University Alumni Board and a member of the Paul class of 1984. As an elected representative of over 31,000 DePaul alumni, I wanted to welcome and congratulate, on behalf of those alumni, Dr. White in becoming the 21st president of DePaul University. I further want to congratulate Dr. White on being the first woman and the first person of color to hold that distinction. Though she has been on the job for over a year, this inauguration on October 1 is a dramatic step for DePaul University. Since its founding in 1837, DePaul University has developed an alumni base that has achieved uncommon success in its endeavors. There is no doubt in my mind that DePaul is in excellent hands and will continue to develop the leaders 
to create positive change in their communities and the world. The energy, positivity, and drive for performance that is sustainable are all apparent in Dr. White's efforts. The alumni board is proud of the institution it represents. It is ready to support and carry out the initiatives developed by Dr. White and her team. The board knows full well that changes are forthcoming. Given the current state of secondary education and to pause place in that world, we look forward to supporting those changes and will that will continue to keep DePaul as a top worldwide educa education institution. The Alumni Board thanks Dr. White for her service, energy, and devotion to DePaul. Let us know how we can help you in your plans. We will be proud to do so. Thank you all for those wonderful <laughs> greetings. It is now my pleasure to present the DePauw Festival Choir directed by Eric Schmidt. They will be accompanied by the DePauw University Band directed by Craig Pare and by Amanda Hobson on piano.
Wow. In the tradition of DePaul's many world-class writers and poets, Eugene Gloria, the John Rabb Emerson Professor of Creative and Performing Arts and Professor of English, composed a poem, Outside of Eden, for this occasion that he will now share with us. Professor Gloria also shares the same hometown, San Francisco, California, with President White. Good afternoon. I was told I have 20 minutes to do this, <laughs> but I'll keep it short. For Laurie S. White, 21st President of DePauw University. Outside of Eden. Small things like the dew on leafy foliage can decide a new beginning. Autumn's golden leaves red with rage and dawn unfurls its mantlet of light. Here then is the promise that soars above the broad chalice of limestone rimmed with rocks and rocky trails and bird chatter competing with human voices thrust against the wind. Open-eyed sophomores awakening to love, and a lone junior falls asleep beside a window, her face pressed against an open book by Gwendolyn Brooks. Here she is being you, being me, housed in dreams. Let the window beg the sun to waken the body and fuel its engine with the flame that burns within. Every living soul is a work in progress, a blueprint etched with risk and trust. It trusts the open eyes to see. Seniors descending on stairwells in twos and threes each one a burning sun, babbling the good slang of poets, a cadence that is always on the wind. Oh, to be them and be them always. Outside of Eden, we behold what goodness guides them. It is now my distinct pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker for today, Holden Thorpe. Dr. Thorpe is Editor-in-Chief of Science and is the Rita Levy Moltalcini Distinguished University Professor at Washington University in St. Louis, with appointments in both chemistry and medicine. He appointed President White to the position of Vice Chancellor for Student Affairs and became close friends with President White during part of his tenure as the Provost and Executive Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs at Washington University from 2013 through 2019. Prior to his arrival at Washington University, Dr. Thorpe also held the position of Chancellor at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill from 2008 to 2013. On a more personal note, Dr. Thorpe is quite an accomplished bass musician. So do not be surprised if he quietly slips off the stage after his remarks to join the university band for the recessional. Please join me in welcoming our keynote speaker, Dr. Holden Thorpe. Thank you, and hello, everybody. Anyone want some nice, refreshing hot water? <laughs> it's so great to be with you all today. Can anyone move the sun back there? Oh. Chair Vrabeck, trustees, students, 
faculty, staff, and alumni, congratulations. Today is a great occasion in the life of your university. I can't tell you how honored I am to be a part of it. President White and Tony, congratulations to you. Today is a day of celebration for you and your family. It is a day of affirmation and inspiration. We have a saying in our line of work that every day you put your robe on is a good day. Lori and I have something in common, which is that from time to time, we've both thought about joining the clergy. Now, I know from experience that by being a college president, Lori has more or less come to the same thing for four reasons. Number one, she visits the sick. Number two, she asks her congregation for money. <laughs> I hope the trustees heard that. Uh, number three, occasionally she puts on a robe, stands in a pulpit, and says something inspirational. And number four, everyone thinks they know how to do her job. <laughs> There are more direct connections, of course. The titles, chancellor, provost, dean, these all arose in the church. When I was a provost, I was always reminding my dean colleagues that the deans were the folks who made the decisions. And they were always reminding me that the provost was the person who kept the prison. <laughs> to the people of DePaul University, and to DePaul University itself, congratulations. You have a proud history. Like many great institutions, you began in the church. But in a great act of vision, you were founded to be an ecumenical institution of national stature that would be conducted on the most liberal principles, accessible to all religious denominations, and designed for the benefit of citizens in general. When Matthew Simpson and Washington C. DePaul were laying all of this out, they could not have imagined how well their vision would be realized. They are smiling today. They're smiling because their vision is alive and well and has been entrusted to someone who is uniquely prepared to carry it out and adapt it to today. Someone who understands and values the liberal arts tradition while realizing at the same time that it can only survive and thrive when it is honestly interrogated and changed when needed. Someone who understands that an institution is not just a bank account and a handbook full of policies that it's a messy, pulsating group of opinionated, brilliant people who are only trying to change the world. People of DePauw, you weren't searching for a heart of gold. You found it. And I'm an inorganic chemist. <laughs> So I know a thing or two about precious metals. <laughs> On December 19, 1932, in Lincoln, Nebraska, Lori's father, Joseph White, was born. He overcame every barrier there was to get a PhD in psychology from Michigan State University and begin an academic career that eventually led him to being known as the godfather of black psychology. He taught us to see the world in strengths not deficits. Fortunately, when they were both students at San Francisco State, he met his wife, Myrtle Escort, who supported him and raised his three amazing daughters. They all changed the world. Lisa led us in earth sciences, doing outstanding research and pushing for justice and equity in academia. <laughs> 
Lynn created transformative art. And they're here today to see their sister lead this important institution into the future. So while the founders of DePauw are smiling today in heaven, they're not smiling nearly as much as Joseph White or as much as Myrtle White is smiling here in Greencastle. Every one of their daughters is solid gold. The hopes and dreams of the slave. Black oceans wide. Finding Lori White couldn't have come at a more important time. We are living through an era where there is a vast disconnect between the inside and outside of universities and what each wants. And there is massive confusion about what to do about it what and how we teach, how we manage pandemics, the place of expertise, the role of athletics, Greek life, sexual violence, there is almost no agreement on any of it. The outside thinks the inside is narcissistic, weak, and self-absorbed. And the inside thinks the outside is racist, sexist, homophobic, transphobic, out of touch, and unappreciative of the sanctity of knowledge for its own sake. This creates a situation where presidents are so busy trying to soothe both sides that they can't make either happy. Well, here's where the confusion comes in. Because somehow everyone forgot that higher education never promised the outside world that we would make you feel comfortable. In fact, our whole purpose is to challenge you and make you feel uncomfortable. That's what the liberal arts tradition is. And while you were not promised comfort, you were promised an ecumenical institution of national stature. And that can't happen when the campus is in turmoil or engaged in some protracted ideological battle. You took exactly the right step to deal with this when you hired Lori White to be your president. Because there is absolutely no one in higher education better prepared to bring and keep a campus together, which is what you hired her to do. You did the right thing because there is no one more honest, no more principled decision maker, no better cheerleader, no better listener, no better leader, and Mr. President, no greater champion for students. At the very heart of our community, she said, are our students, scholars, musicians, student athletes, community activists and leaders who are smart, inquisitive, thoughtful, compassionate, and are a daily source of great inspiration and optimism for the future of our country and the world. By now you've seen how much she means this. She's 24 karat gold. So when people are standing where we're sitting right now, and chanting and holding signs, don't call her up and tell her what to do. She already knows what to do. And you already know what she's going to do. Because Lori White knows that DePaul University doesn't belong to the trustees. It doesn't belong to the administration. It doesn't belong to the faculty. It doesn't belong to the staff. It doesn't belong to the students. DePaul University belongs to them all. It belongs to the cosmos. It belongs to the ages. That's what shared governance is. When it works, there isn't a dominant voice. Lori White has spent her life in higher education 
and knows what it takes to make shared governance truly shared. So don't tie her up getting her to explain all of this when the time comes. It will just slow everyone down and put you on the wrong side of history. <laughs> Plus, if you haven't figured it out, she ain't going to let nobody turn her around. <laughs> and I know from experience that if you let her fly, she's worth her weight in gold. Actually, she's only 5'2", so she's worth a whole lot more. <laughs> as much as she is a champion for students, however, she is just as devoted to scholarship and the liberal arts tradition. Her undergraduate degree is a BA in psychology and English. She knows the difference between thinking fast and thinking slow, and that thinking slow is a whole lot better. She knows the importance of language and the close reading of texts, from Shakespeare and Chaucer to James Baldwin and Audre Lorde. And she knows that no field stays the same, there's no fixed canon, and that only in reaching for the new can scholarship thrive. We need these traits now more than ever, because what we have seen in the last year is that scientists have triumphed at science, at virology, vaccinology, and immunology, but we have utterly failed the social science and the humanities. We failed to transmit basic facts about masks and vaccines. We failed at stopping people from ingesting aquarium cleaner and horse drugs. We failed at building trust in communities that have not been treated fairly by medicine and science throughout history. In short, we failed the liberal arts. We failed to ask the right questions about the world. We failed to understand humanity, history, and text. We failed to look at the data that describe human behavior. And we failed to invite those that do understand these things into our processes. There's only one solution, Tigers, and it's in your hands. It's in your hands to both adapt your offerings to the progress and reality of today while preserving the liberal arts tradition in all your degrees for all your students. Of course, we need scientists and business people who understand the foundations of their disciplines. But don't let the degrees get filled with so much didactic material that the world is crowded out. I know it sounds strange that the editor of science wants scientists to take fewer science courses. But we live in a world where the biggest problem is not our mastery of scientific disciplines, but that scientific advances are not reaching those who need them. A world where the obvious facts about the nature and history of racism, sexism, and homophobia are not registering. A world where it's okay to just make things up and pretend they're real. The liberal arts tradition is the solution to this problem. And with Lori White at the helm, I have no worries that it's leaving DePauw anytime soon. As the godfather of black psychology said, it's about strength, not deficit. And as the other godfather said, I feel good. <laughs> I feel good because the liberal arts tradition of courage and challenge has never been in better hands. I feel good because Lori White ain't going to let nobody turn to paw around. I feel good because the arc of the moral universe is bending towards justice here in Greencastle.
And I feel good because for once, someone who glitters is gold. <laughs> 24 karat solid gold. Gold within. Congratulations to President White and the people of DePaul University. Thank you for that wonderful address and for being here with us today, Dr. Thorpe. It's now my pleasure to introduce Chloe Johnson. Yeah. Class of 2022, who will sing The Impossible Dream. She will be accompanied by Amanda Hobson on piano. Thank you, Chloe, for such a moving performance. As a proud alumna of DePauw, it is such an honor to serve as the chair of the Board of Trustees. I am extremely fortunate to serve with such an esteemed group of fellow trustees. And while everyone has given more of their time during these past few years as the university navigated the pandemic and a presidential transition, I'd like to take a moment to give an extra special thanks to trustee Justin Christian. He's over here somewhere, there we go. Justin led the presidential search committee that led us to Dr. White. He stepped up and leaned in as the father of four girls. Assembling a committee, committees listed in your program, which represented all of DePauw's constituent groups, 
leading the work to develop a position profile which reflected days of listening sessions, personally reaching out to potential candidates, and ultimately guiding the committee through multiple rounds of interviews and discussions to land on the most fantastic selection. Thank you, Justin. Our university is forever in your debt. Well, Dr. White, we are finally here. When I had the pleasure of announcing your appointment the first couple of days of March 3rd, 2020, we could not have imagined how significantly the world would change just a few weeks later. On behalf of the trustees, thank you for taking on your new presidency with such enthusiasm and determination and joy during such a time of uncertainty. Thank you for already caring so deeply. For our beloved institution. But I'm turning my cup up, is that right? Okay. And its community of students, faculty, staff, alumni, friends, and neighbors. And on a more personal note, as you've already heard from others, thank you for modeling to young girls and women of all races what university presidential leadership can look like. It is a privilege of a lifetime for me as a former young girl from Muncie, Indiana, to be up here on this stage with you. DePaul University has installed a president on only 20 previous occasions, a fact that attests to the depth of commitment to the university each of our leaders has demonstrated. All have been individuals of uncommon success, energy, sure vision, and resolute determination. Dr. White. I would like to draw your attention to the seal behind me. The seal was adopted 118 years ago. On the outside, you see the words Universitatis, Depa Ennis, Sigillium, Green Castelli, Indiana. Meaning, I think it's Indiana, meaning the seal of DePaul University, Greencastle, Indiana. Inside the circle, though, are more powerful and beautiful words. Decus Lumineque, Reupiblicae, Collegium, meaning the college is the splendor and light of the common good. President White, Lumen, meaning light or guiding light, can ever remind you that wherever a university exists, free inquiry, debate, and scholarship provide pathways toward enlightenment. Decus, meaning splendor, and rei publicae, meaning the common good, underscore how this enlightenment is not just utilitarian, but rather the glory or the splendor of the entire republic the true mark of freedom and advancement for all people, regardless of race, creed, or religion. We trust that you will continue heralding DePaul ever onward along a path of distinction guided by this moral compass. And now, by the virtue of the authority of the DePaul University Board of Trustees, I bestow upon you the Presidential Medallion with the great seal of the university, the symbol of the high office which you now hold. This medallion is only worn by the university president and the current board chair of the trustees. Here we go. President White, on behalf of the trustees, I welcome you as the 21st president of DePaul University, and I assure you of our confidence in you and pledge our support to you as you strive to continue the greatness
that is this university's destiny. Friends of the university, I now present to you the 21st president of DePaul University, Lori S. White. Now, I do have a little speech to give, so y'all might just sit back down. Well, good afternoon, DePaul. Good afternoon. Wow, is all that I can say. And thank you, Chloe, for that stirring rendition of The Impossible Dream. How about another hand clap of praise for Chloe? <laughs> the Impossible Dream was my father's favorite song. And Chloe, you didn't realize when you sat next to me last spring in 2000 that you would be singing at my inauguration. So thank you so much. You have an absolutely beautiful voice. And I know my father was just looking down from heaven in pride as he heard you sing his favorite song. Thank you, Holden, for your incredible remarks. And Professor Gloria, who is from my hometown of San Francisco, we went to rival high schools, for your inspirational poem. Thank you to all of the speakers who brought greetings, to the musicians who brought uplift, to, to the symposium and leadership panel participants, to the prayer breakfast preachers, and to everyone who went above and beyond the call of duty to make this day possible. It is so wonderful to see all of you here, my DePauw family, my chosen and extended family, and my family family who's sitting right over there. <laughs> my family family includes my mother, Mrs. Myrtle Escort White, my sisters, Mrs. Lynn White Kell and Dr. Lisa D. White, my stepmother, Mrs. Lois White, my mother-in-law, Mrs. Joanne Baskerville, sisters-in-laws, Camille Lewis and Nikisha Williams, my niece, Alasia Reeves, and of course, that handsome, dashing first gentleman, Anthony Tony Tillman. Would my family stand and please be recognized? Oh, and my cousin, Brett Waterfield. Brett, I didn't mean to not acknowledge you. To all of my family, friends, and mentors present here and tuning in virtually, it means so much to me to have you take part in today's celebration. And I'd like to give a special shout out to my 90 plus years young Aunt Betty, who was unable to travel to be with us today. My inauguration is the first family celebration that my Aunt Betty has ever missed, and Aunt Betty, I know that you are here in spirit. Daddy, this is also the first milestone of mine that you have missed, and I know how proud you would be. And in fact, I know that you are marching around heaven in that booming voice that none of us will ever forget, telling everyone that your daughter is a college president. Dr. Parham, thank you for inviting the ancestors into this space so that we can be sure my daddy and all of those who come before us are present to bear witness to the realization of their hopes and their dreams. Those ancestors dreamed the impossible dream that one day I would stand at a place where the bright gleam of their bright star was cast. I would certainly not be here if not for my family family, and I also wouldn't be here if it were not for my chosen family, otherwise known as the Freedom Train. The, the Freedom Train is a metaphor coined by my father, Dr. Joseph White, to represent the journey through undergraduate, graduate school, and educational leadership. The conductor of the Freedom Train is a respected elder, teacher, mentor, who picks up passengers along the way, and passengers in turn, through their own commitments to mentorship and paying life forward, bring others aboard the train. 
So today, we are joined by members of my dad's and my freedom train from all over the country. So would the members of the freedom train please stand so that all might see how long our freedom train stretches. Dr. Pa, it is this train that helped to carry me to the Greencastle, Indiana station. And there are so many others across time and generations who have helped guide my feet to this place where I stand before you today. Members of the Board of Trustees, faculty, staff, alumni, and delegates, and students, and other honored guests, thank you for this presence on this joyful, very hot fall day and for welcoming me so graciously into the DePauw family. Today's ceremony is an infusion of many traditions and has included important acknowledgments, music, spoken word, and symbols to honor the relevance of this occasion and the reverence of this occasion. Speaking of traditions, those of you who have heard me speak previously know that I come from the African-American call response tradition. That means that I'm inviting you to be more than just a witness for my remarks. I am inviting you to be an active participant. So if in the course of my address, I say anything that resonates with you, it's okay to respond with a hand clap, a snap of your fingers, or even an amen. Y'all got that? Amen. And my favorite musical genre is old Negro spirituals that I often quote and sometimes even sing verses from. Know that my reference to a spiritual in my speaking is from a cultural perspective. This is an inauguration, not a revival meeting. Though the many bishops who served as DePaul's presidents before me might say amen to that. When I considered what theme would represent the spirit and vision of my inauguration, I chose and still I rise by the great Maya Angelou my mother's favorite poet. In her poem, And Still I Rise, Angelou conveys the audacious swagger of someone who despite all manner of challenge still believes in the impossible dream, a dream compelled forward by the hopes and the gifts of the ancestors that dares to claim a future that looks dramatically different from the past and the present. And so I rise because my foremothers and forefathers, including those who were enslaved when DePaul was founded in 1837, face the rising sun of each new day begun and marched on till victory was won. I rise because my maternal grandparents, Ernest and Louise Escort, left their home in Beaumont, Texas for California as part of the great migration of black Americans out of the South so that they and their four children would not be subject to Jim Crow. I rise from the Midwest roots of my paternal great-grandparents, Blanche and David Lee, the son of a Missouri plantation owner Together, they raised six children and each ran their own successful businesses in Lincoln, Nebraska. I rise because my mother and my forever role model, Myrtle Escort White, was one of only two African Americans in her graduating class to become a registered nurse. She went on to raise three fierce and confident daughters and told us that we could aspire to do and to be anything that we wanted. I rise because my father, the first African-American to receive his PhD in clinical psychology from Michigan State University, became, in his words, the first black psychologist that he had ever met. <laughs> and he believed that faith is the evidence of things not seen. I rise because of the students who have been the why of my work for 40 years, who each year compel me to renew my commitment to this field called higher education. Yeah. 
I rise because our founders, 184 years ago, believed in the dream of a great university. I rise because the presidents who came before me met the challenges and opportunities of their time, forging the DePaul legacy that I and we now inherit. And I rise because of this great institution's other firsts. Matthew Simpson, Alice Allen, Laura Bewick, Betty McReynolds Locke, Mary Euphemia Simmons, Amanda Beck, Tucker Wilson, Alma Holman, Catherine Alvord, Percy Julian, Bing Davis, Stanley Warren, and Dorothy Brown. These are some of the great women and men upon whose shoulders I now stand, who paved the way for me to stand before you today now and officially as the 21st president of DePaul University. I understand the great responsibility that comes with the title president of DePaul University, and I humbly and publicly accept this title and the responsibilities. Members of the Board of Trustees, thank you for entrusting me with the leadership of this special place. I commit to faithfully exercising all of the rights and privileges that come with all the bling that I have just been given. <laughs> and to remember that leadership is most effective when carried out in service to others and for a greater good. Amen. And I ask for the support of all assembled for the journey ahead. <clears throat> and what a great university I have the privilege of leading. A university that is the number one liberal arts college in the state of Indiana and among the top tier of liberal arts colleges in the entire country. A university that has gifted faculty committed to teaching, scholarship, and artistic expression. Outstanding staff who contribute each day to our mission in innumerable ways passionate alumni who were so successful in their fields that the famous alumni section of our wiki page has too many columns to count. <laughs> and a university with the most incredible students from all across the country and the world who have chosen to paw for their undergraduate education and who approach their studies with fervor and curiosity, who will each make their own indelible mark on our world. Students, let me hear you make some noise. <laughs> this is not, however, an easy time to be a college president, especially one who assumed office in the midst of a global pandemic. There are, to quote a line from one of my favorite spirituals, trials dark on every hand. Notwithstanding the pandemic, there are three trials dark, or in layperson's language, three challenges for higher education that we must face and overcome together. First, we must confront a declining public trust in the institution of higher education. A 2018 Gallup poll found that less than half of the American public expressed confidence in higher education. According to the pollsters, no other major American institution has seen a steeper decline in recent memory. Not the military, not law enforcement, not the church, not the US presidency, not the Supreme Court, nor the medical profession. We are viewed as too expensive, not accessible and not relevant. In other instances, we are not seen as reflecting the diversity of our local communities, a perception that college is for other people, but not for me. In other instances, some critics call out student and faculty activism as evidence that higher education is too woke. And debates about what constitutes free expression on campus seems almost daily contested terrain across the political spectrum. Second, 
The demographic and geographic makeup of DePaul's prospective students, particularly in the Midwest, is changing dramatically. We must expand our reach to serve a population of students that is more geographically dispersed and the most diverse racially, culturally, and economically that we have ever seen in our country's history. And the competition for these talented students will only increase, as will the expectations of these students for their chosen colleges and universities. And as we confront the second challenge, we must do so amid the backdrop of our third. And it's a familiar one, the long-held misunderstanding of the value of the liberal arts. We face ongoing questions about the practicality and the sufficiency of DePaul's hallmark strengths as a liberal arts university, a commitment to teaching critical thinking, exemplary writing, collaboration, and teamwork, and the ability to understand difference and engage with those whose life experiences are different from our own. So right about now, y'all might be thinking, well, I thought inauguration speeches were supposed to be uplifting. And President White, you have just spent the last few minutes outlining all that is wrong with higher education. My point in describing these challenges is so that we can answer the questions that are most pressing as we gather today. How will DePaul rise? How will this great institution flourish in spite of these trials? How will we ensure that DePaul in its 200th year fulfills the mission that has been present since its founding to ignite in students an educational passion that many did not even realize that they had and to prepare our students for lives of promise and uncommon success? The answer lies before me in the hearts and in the spirit of those gathered today it lies in the countless strengths of this community and its people. And I have every faith that together we will rise. First, we will rise because we possess the ability to evolve and change while still being true to our foundational roots. That change we must, and likely more quickly and with greater urgency than has been required before. We must ensure our curriculum is relevant and responsive to the needs of the world that our students will inherit and shape. We will renew and revitalize our academic programs and deepen our long-standing commitment to the liberal arts while creating new and distinctive programs that reflect advances in academic disciplines, respond to students' changing priorities, and adapt to the demands of a rapidly evolving economy and society. And we will continue to pause longstanding strength of preparing scholars and graduates with skills and experiences that equip them to provide leadership the world needs. Second, we will rise by making access to a DePauw education among our greatest priorities. Without question, for far too many, the cost of higher education is too steep. And DePauw's ability to attract and retain the most talented students depends on our ability to meet their financial needs. To be clear, the residential education that we provide here at DePauw, small classes, personal attention to students, a focus on community, is expensive. It's labor intensive, it is holistic, and it works. And it is, without question, worth it. Those of us who love DePaul can be proud that we are among the nation's leaders in fostering social mobility. And we can take pride in the fact that 98.5% of DePaul students are supported by institutional financial aid and scholarships. <laughs> However, we must do even more toward meeting the full financial need of students who I know are making do out of don't, as my mother would say, to pay for their college education. Our commitment to access is not new, but it is ongoing and as urgent as ever, and it will be one of my highest fundraising priorities as president. I say this, thank you, yes, cheer for that. 
I say this because our model of education must simultaneously appeal to talented students with the means to afford it while having the resources to make it accessible to talented students who may not. I've spoken with so many alumni, including many of you here today, who tell me a DePauw education transformed your lives. And many of you credit the generosity of previous classes of alumni for making DePauw possible for you. It seems particularly fitting that this generosity lives on in one of our newest scholarship funds, the Vernon E. Jordan Jr. Scholarship for Public Service. This new scholarship honors one of our most illustrious alumni, a student from Atlanta, Georgia, who made his way to DePauw, rose to advise presidents, and lead one of our nation's most prominent civil rights organizations. His story should remind us that great students hail from all corners of our state, our country, and the world. I want every high school student in the state of Indiana to know that a DePauw education is attainable. I want Purdue, IU, Butler, and Wabash to know that if there's a talented student in this state, we are coming for him. Right. Likewise in St. Louis, Chicago, Cincinnati, and Columbus. And we'll also find the next Vernon Jordans in countless other big cities, small towns, and countries worldwide. We will ensure the most talented students, including those whose potential is yet untapped, have the desire and the means to choose DePaul. Third, we will rise by becoming living proof that free expression and diversity, equity, and inclusion can and must coexist. The heart of a liberal arts education is the free exchange of ideas. This approach expects students to learn to express, explore, challenge, refute, and debate ideas with those who hold different views than their own. And even when, or perhaps especially when, those ideas make us uneasy, uncomfortable, or mad. However, a commitment to free expression must be built on a foundation of inclusion and equity. <laughs> Diversity is a necessary condition for the coexistence of different ideas and perspectives and inclusion a necessary condition for every member of our community to feel welcomed, affirmed, and respected. And in the context of freedom of expression, equity means that we develop, sustain, and uphold a clear set of community values, standards, and expectations, such that a commitment to freedom of expression and to diversity, equity, and inclusion extends to and is lived by all members of our community our students, our faculty, our staff, our board, our alumni. In a community marked by true inclusion and equity, even fierce debates about a range of differences of opinions and perspectives are not experienced as personal attacks on one's very humanity and sense of well-being and belonging. In my time as president, DePaul will become a more diverse, a more inclusive, and a more equitable institution. In a country where we sadly are increasingly living physically and virtually in echo chambers, a small residential liberal arts university is one of the few places left where students from diverse backgrounds and experiences can learn to live, study, work, and communicate with people who are different from those in the neighborhoods in which they grew up. And a place where we understand the responsibility to community that comes with the freedom to express oneself freely. We will forever remain committed to this endeavor 
to equip students to explore and to seek answers to historical, philosophical, scientific, and moral questions about the human condition. That is why I believe that liberal arts colleges like DePauw are crucial now more than ever to our ability to create a better, more just, and a more humane world. And finally, we will rise by staying true to this noble purpose and keeping our mission to contribute to the betterment of society at the very core of who we are. DePaul must live up to its motto and be the splendor and light of the common good. We will equip students for service and leadership, foster artistic expression, and encourage the curiosity that undergirds research and academic pursuits. Our scholarship will contribute to scientific discovery, to sustainability, to improving the lives of others. And we will prepare our students to create community here in Greencastle and in all of the places they will live and work when they graduate from DePauw. These are all of the ways in which we will rise as a university and a community to meet the challenges of our time and our responsibilities to the society at large and to the world. I will close my remarks by taking the liberty of using a phrase from one of the many famous speeches of Dr. Martin Luther King. This one titled, The Drum Major Instinct. In his speech, Dr. King encourages the audience in describing his work his leadership and his legacy to say he was a drum major. And those of you who know me well are thinking, I knew she would have a sports analogy in here somewhere. In Dr. King's speech, the drum major is a metaphor for lifting up the values he held most high. So one day in the future, when my legacy as the president of DePauw is reviewed by others, I hope that people will say of our time working together that I too was a drum major, that I was a drum major for faith, that I was a drum major for equity, that I was a drum major for spirit. I hope you will say that as a drum major for faith, I carried with me the faith of our founders, their belief in 1837 that a great university could rise from the mud of a frontier town, and that almost 200 years later, DePauw is not only still standing, but flourishing that it is one of the great universities of the 21st century. I hope you will say that as a drum major for equity, I live the values of diversity, equity, and inclusion, and that through my leadership and my partnership with all of you, DePauw became an institution fully accessible to any seeking to join our affirming community, and that through our work, DePauw stands as a model of free expression and inclusion. And I hope you will say that I was a drum major for spirit, for the spirit that binds generations of DePauw students, alumni, and friends to one another, such that each of us who loves DePauw is willing to give our time, our talent, and our treasure, so that each succeeding generation of the old gold will be able to stand where we stand today and achieve their own impossible dream, that together, we will rise and forever toast to old DePauw. We rise, we rise, we rise. Thank you, President White. I look forward to many years working with you on behalf of the university. And now, in honor of the theme of this special day, I invite you to enjoy a performance of Still I Rise by the DePauw Chamber Singers under the direction of Eric Schmidt and accompanied by Laura Brumbaugh on piano. At the close of this performance, we would like to ask everyone who is able to stand as Bryce Taylor, class of 22, 
sings a toast to old DePauw. Due to the COVID considerations, the community is asked to refrain from joining in. Please then remain standing until the conclusion of the benediction led by University Chaplain Maureen Knudsen Langdock. To old Depaul we toast today and raise our voices high. We'll honor thee and loyal be and praise thee to the sky. 
Let every son and daughter stand united air for thee and herald gold throughout the land here's to you older pa Receive now, receive now this benediction. Let us rise because our foundations are in good places. Let us rise because there is strength in our life together. Let us rise because we have been offered a good tomorrow. And let us rise and go in peace and power and purpose. Amen. Honored guest, please be seated and remain seated for the academic recessional, which serves as the formal closing to this installation ceremony. You are all cordially invited to attend the reception for President White in the Great Hall in the Green Center for the Performing Arts immediately following the ceremony. Those in the academic processional will join you at the reception. My sincere thanks to all who have joined us on this warm afternoon to celebrate the beginning of a great new chapter in the history of DePauw University. Will those in the academic recessional please rise? 